I'm Chantal Pratt, a professor at the University of Washington with appointments in psychology, linguistics, and neuroscience, and the author of the new book, The Neuroscience of You. Today, we're gonna to talk about why a one-size-fits-all approach to leadership doesn't fit anyone very well, and why leadership needs to learn to recognize and appreciate neurodiversity. Finally, we'll discuss where the idea of the logical left-brain thinker comes from and why your ideas about it may be misguided. Stay tuned. Welcome back to part two of our delicious conversation with Dr. Chantel Pratt. She is a professor of psychology, neuroscience, and linguistics at the University of Washington. Her debut book, which is this one, is called The Neuroscience of You. And it has taken off like a rocket. It's become incredibly popular. It's been featured in the Next Big Idea Club. It, uh, research has been featured in a wide variety of media, including Nature, Scientific America, Rolling Stone, and Popular Mechanics. And in part one of the show, in case you missed it, go back and have a listen. It's about, we talked about how one size fits all doesn't work in our own brains, and it certainly doesn't work for us in leadership. We talked about what motivates and inspires people versus what guides people and how we can look at that. We took a look at even problem solving, that it's not a singular thing that we come together naturally as groups in order to uh, solve problems. We also looked at cognitive bias, how we have our own biases that we put forward, that we think what the world operates like and what the dangers of that are moving forward. And that really takes us into the second part of the show, which is this cognitive bias that we don't know we, we have, which is thinking that we have it right. And maybe we are very well researched and maybe we do know a lot, but this not bothering to go any further and how that plays into this understanding of cognitive diversity. Because as I said, this book is called The Neuroscience of You, and it really challenges the idea that we've all gotten, um, specific, particularly in the last 10 or so years, which is, you know, you have a brain and we all have a brain. And when neuroscience is spoken about, it's spoken about in a very general way. But yet this book points out that we're all kind of different. There's billions and billions of neurons and neuron connections <laughs> inside of our brain, and they're all operating in a slightly different way. So let's dive back in with Chantel. Let's talk about neurodiversity. Explain what that means, and then we can dive into that a little bit. Oh, thank you so much, because um, people use the words neurodiversity and neurodivergent as mm -hmm. synonyms, and they really aren't. They really right. aren't synonyms. I think that, um, well, what neurodivergent, what neurodiversity means is that there are a number of axes on which brains vary. Our brains are diverse. And I think for simplicity reasons, because neuroscience is still a very young science, we have taken this one size fits all approach that kind of sells the story that normal, quote unquote, is a, a single value. Mm -hmm. And when we describe how brains work, we describe them using a group average that kind of treats the way that individuals vary as a statistical noise, as measurement error. But in fact, Ooh. there are true differences, obviously, in the way brains work. And there are multiple axes that I discuss in the book from neurochemistry, sort of how much dopamine or serotonin or oxytocin or, you know, norepinephrine, you've got cortisol, whatever you've got going on in your brain, the neurochemicals are the language that your neurons use to communicate with one another. So right. from neurochemistry to lopsidedness or laterality, how the different halves of your brain are organized um, to neural synchronization, there are all these different design features. And for each of these design features, there's a, a, a spectrum. And that spectrum extends both within the quote unquote normal range and outside of the quote unquote normal range. So neurodivergent is a word that's used to describe somebody who has been labeled with some mm. kind of an atypical diagnosis, whether it's ADHD or autism, it's an acknowledgement that rather than this being a deficit-based label, it's just 
a spectrum. It's a place on which my brain falls outside of what's considered quote unquote normal. But I think that neurodivergent is still a term that assumes that we have like, like two values, normal and abnormal. And maybe there are different buckets that you go into in this abnormality. And I think that, um, as we start to understand and celebrate the ways that all brains are different, we can, I hope, bring in people who have been, you know, lie somewhere on that spectrum that is past the cutoff of what we consider a typical Mm -hmm. or normal brain. And instead start to understand the differences in this, in and outside of the spectrum, because neurodiversity is both within and outside of the quote unquote normal bucket. I think that it's really important for us to, to recognize that this term, which I've been talking about since the early nineties, which is this term of normal yeah, is such a destructive term. Yeah. That's why I'm um, always air quoting. Right. Because normal implies natural. Yes. Uh, or uh, even and, ideal. Right. Or, uh, uh, or it's a category and the truth of the matter is, as I say to people all the time, normal is whatever the hell you got used to. Mm-hmm. That's what normal is. It's normal for you. Mm-hmm. So if your dad came home every Tuesday night and beat the snot out of you, that becomes normal for Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. now, you and I can look at that from the outside and go, wow, that's not normal. But mm-hmm. it is for Johnny, you got that. And mm-hmm. we have to recognize that. And that mm-hmm. we've developed a brain and coping mechanisms in neurochemistry uh, uh, around all those things. So I want to get rid of this term of normal. I know. Right. And I want to, I want to have us say like own normal as in normal for me, but is not necessarily healthy for me. Mm-hmm. Cause there are a lot of things from my childhood that were very normal that were very unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Right. And so yeah. don't mix those two things up. And then in your context of what you're saying is like, we've categorized normal in this, sort of peak at the bell curve. And if you fall off that bell curve, so it's almost like you've lost your value. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, well, you know, let's look back at some of the geniuses of the world. They would definitely not fall into the top of that bell curve. In fact, maybe they would fall to the extremes of some of those Mm -hmm. curves. And I think we've got to really grasp that. So when I talk about neurodiversity as you as i said your book is all really about that he's understanding that some people's brains are different than others talk to us a little bit about this lopsidedness because i think this is a fascinating subject i know you like talking about it and i know that people have these categories of you're a left brain you're a right brain again as i said it has some truth to it but you really showed about the lopsidedness talk to us about that Yeah. Well, I, first I want to back you up and say that even in science, when we're talking about what is quote unquote normal, Mm -hmm. we confound one thing, which is frequency. How typical is this way of being Mm -hmm. and and functionality? That's how well is this way of being working for you? And so some of our things, some of our definitions of abnormal are quite frequent, like depression, Mm -hmm. right? Or ADHD. And some of our ways of being atypical might be like, you know, quite, quite super functional yes. in, a, in the right environment. So I just want to back you up on that. It's a very good point too. It's very you good know, point. normalcy is it, it's, it's a word that some people are just talking about how typical is this way of being. And then we associate it with ideal. And then if you're not that way, then you start to feel othered. And I think it's a, it's a real problem. Pin. Yeah. <laughs> in that discussion point, because I think it's so important. And I often even I just don't even like the word normal. And I think tip, I think I should just be more specific and say typical or functional. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I told you about this, that I gave a talk at a school years and years ago, a friend of mine who was a teacher and she said, would you come speak to my, my kids who were all about 14, this stadium, or this hallway, or whatever it is, the auditorium of 700 kids. And I talked about being a freak. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the gift of being a freak and why I wanted, I was a freak when I was a kid at school mm-hmm. and now I support freaks and, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the popular kids are the ones who were not freaks, but those are the ones who will fade into oblivion when they get older. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> so you've already peaked at 15. And so be a freak, whatever your freakiness is, embrace it. And I got all these freaks and taught them all like the secret handshake of freaks. Right. And, oh, and awesome. I was like, for a week, right? <laughs> just because I'm a freak. And, and all it yeah. means is that I'm willing to think in a different way. And I think if we're going to be great leaders, we've got to look at that. We look at leadership as getting people to conform, right? Like we're getting people, like we're drill sergeants trying to get people to conform. And we, immediately we repress uh, their innovation. We, we create these um, cultures of fitting in rather than belonging. And we repress and deny and disenfranchise so many parts of themselves. So let's come back to what you were, uh, what I was asking you about, which is the lopsided brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the lopsidedness is a really fun topic because if people acknowledge uh, neurodiversity, they might say I'm a left brain analytical type or I'm a right brain creative thinker. Like this is one of the only commonly held, I think, brain terms that people use to talk about differences. And um, and there's some truth to that, mm -hmm. to the idea that the left hemisphere in most people seems to uh, be so the sort of analytical type, what what Michael Gazaniga showed in his patient studies when he looked at people who had the two hemispheres severed is basically that your left hemisphere is making shit up all the time. To explain, <laughs> no, I to, love my left then. <laughs> to explain why you're doing what you're doing. So if you ask the left hemisphere to explain what the right hemisphere is doing, it didn't know. It was watching and he's like, oh, I think I just drew a sundial because I saw a watch and I was thinking of the sun and, you know, and, and, and basically he found that this part of the brain makes inferences that connect two events causally and a human brain that has this ability to sort of generate hypotheses about why um, a caused B would be able to predict the future and make better choices. And that this is really interesting and powerful. Um, but it's not necessarily logic. It's really this inferential part of your brain that's tied to language. And for those people who think verbally, that's that kind of running narrative, that thought wheel that you've got going on in your head is your left hemisphere um, kind of linking, making up stories that link two events to one another, which I think so is So inference is interpreted as logic. Is that right? Right. So the wow. interpreter was like the, the popular press version of this interpretive part of the brain turned into logic. Now, why? So uh, things to keep in mind for your listeners. Number one, left-handers are almost never studied in the lab, which is seems unacceptable to me since that's 10% of the population. Yeah, that's bizarre. And it's not bizarre if you think about the fact that we try and ignore differences, right? So if we pretend that differences are just statistical noise, then anybody whose brain is going to mess up my science by being different, we just omit them from our study, which I think is, like I said, my daughter. In her, the way of my grant, so let's leave them out. Exactly. And it's totally, I've been on grant review panels at the NIH. And let me tell you that it would be weirder to include left-handers than to exclude them. It would be more likely to raise a red flag, which I think we have, we do, we just have to be better. Uh, so for, and if you read the book, you'll learn that my daughter's brain is actually left, right, reverse. She is a left-hander. And I learned from reading her brainwaves to language. I actually learned that she was a left-hander before she would reach for things stably with her left hand. So her brain told me about this. Amazing. reversing of her cognition before her hand did. So I say in most people, the left hemisphere does this kind of inferential processing, linking events together, among other things. But that's where the idea of logic came from. And, um, and some of the theories that I cover in the book involve different patterns of connectivity in the two hemispheres. So keep in mind that all vertebrate creatures have basically two brains in in inside their head that mm -hmm. communicate with this high speed kind of ethernet like bundle of white matter neurons that share answers with one mm -hmm. another but the two hemispheres the kind of strength of that is getting two perspectives we're talking about why it's interesting to consider the perspectives of other people but you actually have most of us 
have two perspectives within our own brains, two hemispheres that are understanding the world in different ways, coming together to make decisions, to drive decisions about how you behave. So this left hemisphere interpreter might arise because we have small expert focal modules in the brain that are good at taking one input and creating one output, doing it really quickly and without considering what else is going on in the world Mm. around them. So just like I am a, a a speech sound module, I listen to the speech sounds, I string them together and I output, this is a word I recognize, for instance. Yes. Whereas the right hemisphere is more of a big picture processor in most people, you have broader connections. So in the right hemisphere, you're more likely to link, for instance, vision and sound or, or like feeling and, you know, the big picture kind of forest processing Mm -hmm. larger connections in the brain in most people. But one of the interesting things that we can get out of our handedness is how different those two hemispheres are within us, how different the perspectives of the two sides of our brains are. So left-handers are more likely to have a balanced brain. Mm. They're more likely to have um, job assignment distributed kind of equally to both hemispheres. Um, Their left-handers are more likely to not have strongly dominant Left-handers are more likely to not have strongly dominant left hemispheres, which is where that language interpreter Mm -hmm. calculation comes in. They're more likely to be systems people, to be visual thinkers, to have the big picture, to consider the context. So creativity arose from that (laughs) kind of idea, but it's not, there is no logical or, or research connection that actually says creativity happens in the right. I mean, Both logic and creativity happen because of the symbiosis of the different processing styles of our two hemispheres. Mm. Individual people will rely more on one or the other kind of thinking, but they, we also differ in kind of how strong the perspectives of our, the two halves of our brain are, how strongly different they are. That's really quite fascinating, isn't it? Really. I think so. Really fascinating. So taking that sort of a a little bit deeper that would suggest that that sets up a level of biases within the individual Mm -hmm. um so what what best facilitates us staying curious Mm -hmm. and and learning and what blocks that Mm. oh man that's such a great question so i think the thing that blocks so let's talk about curiosity in the brain. Cause that's something that I know that we're both really interested in, but yeah. when your brain feels curious, it emits dopamine. It gives you a dopamine burst and dopamine motivates you to go explore and find the answer. But for safety reasons, right? You know, curiosity, we, you and I both love it, but we also know that there's a saying called curiosity killed the cat, right? Yep. Because curiosity can get you in trouble. And, you know, it's, it's curiosity in the face of the unknown. So before your brain allows you to feel curious, it assesses whether the unknown is, it, it believes the unknown is going to be safe or not. Right. So I think, um, number one thing that shuts down curiosity is feeling right. Feeling like you have the answer. There's, Mm. if your brain doesn't estimate any information rewards because it thinks you're already right, it's not going to make you feel curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing that I think shuts down curiosity is um, psycho- when you feel psychological threat. Yes. And I think that can happen both in the leader and the team. You know, I think that can happen in any person on any end of the power dynamic, but I think it's easier if you are on the lower end of the power dynamic to feel threat, mm-hmm. right? When somebody's asking you questions and that shuts down curiosity. Um, I think. Um, well, one thing I want to say is that curiosity is important. Not only you're talking about expansiveness, right? Mm -hmm. But when we have that dopamine burst, because our brain has decided that there's an information reward possible, yes, it actually facilitates rewiring. So it facilitates learning memory and skill acquisition. Mm. So 
you, if I asked you two questions and I asked you how curious you were to know the answers of the two questions, I could predict with really high fidelity, which answer you were going to remember better. Oh yeah. Because your brain is actually putting you in the, in the position to learn that thing. So the position, so, so dopamine is part of the learning neurochemistry. That's right. Um, because it's the reward. So we have to, first of all, create um, emotional safety for the person to be curious. Mm -hmm. We have to reward their curiosity in order for them to want to learn. Mm -hmm. And we have to reward the learning and the impl impl uh, implementation of that skill set. When a person feels safe, mm -hmm. th this is something that makes me love humanity. Um, you don't have to, te you don't have to reward a person for learning because Nobody learning is a reward. Right. Uh, if your brain has decided based on your meaning structure, isn't that what you started yep. by asking me? Like, what's yep. my, what's my meaning code? And that's where I think it, it's worth taking the time to figure out your employees and what makes them tick because not everyone finds the same things interesting precisely because they have a meaning system, a value system, a previous experience system. And their brain is saying like this skill or this piece of knowledge is, I'm curious about it because it's going to fit in and it's going to change the way I see myself and the world. Right. Or it's not, you know, they mm -hmm. have, you haven't built that bridge. And so maybe there's some work to do in building the bridge between the way that person, that person's meaning code and this skill set, or maybe it's just not going to be intrinsically rewarding for them. But when learning goes well, mm -hmm. curious, a curious brain looking at a potential information reward looks identical to a hungry brain looking for a piece of food. Yeah. We find information rewarding in and of itself. Yeah. I really found that an interesting piece in the book that the brain responds almost identically to a hunger for food as it does as a hunger for knowledge and and that the reward system is almost identical too when it gets it and so and yet uh, this thing is going on in our society where people are not wanting to be curious and wanting to stick to their way of thinking mm -hmm. um and that only tells me again my interpretation is that it's not safe to learn. It's Correct. not safe to have an opinion that is other than. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when my friends will ask me, how come you know so much about different things? And I'll go, uh, you know, in the news cycle. And I'll go, because I like to mess with the algorithm. And they go, what do you mean? I go, I will click on CNN, but I'll click on Fox and I'll click on Breitbart and I'll click on, and I'll click on uh, Al Jazeera and the BBC because I want different inputs. Mm -hmm. Right. And for me, if it gives me those, there's a reward in my brain. I know that mm -hmm. I feel good. I go, Oh, I got something from <laughs> Sean Hannity who I don't particularly enjoy, but that tells me I'm messing with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. tells me that <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting information from other sources, um, not to disagree with, but to look at and go, where might this person be right? Like, I think, mm -hmm. and this is my opinion. It's not the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that most of what Tucker Carlson talked about was absolute bullshit. Mm -hmm. But every now and then he said something really like, whoa, that's, yep, some mm -hmm. good stuff in that. Mm -hmm. I would not get that good stuff if I was not willing to listen to stuff I disagree with. And I think that's the same with Don Lemon, you know, because those two characters have come to the news lately, or anybody for that matter, mm -hmm. anybody. And, and as leaders, we've got to be willing to understand that we're looking at people with the biases of how we see the world. And uh, rather than understanding that, and my, when I guide leaders, I say, what if you treated everybody, including that schmuck who really drives you mad? Mm -hmm. just in a to sat down with him five minutes and said like in your brain you go you know i know this person's an idiot okay that's your judgment that's fine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what if you sat down with him and you said tell me about your genius bob susan tell me about your genius or oh, i don't have any well if you did the people who know you what would they say you're a genius about 
And it's fascinating because you'll suddenly discover that once you get them through the hurdle of saying it's safe to talk about this, mm -hmm. they will show you something you never knew. Mm -hmm. One of my teachers many, many hundreds of years ago, Stuart Wilde, he's now dead, um, talked about his buddy back when he lived in the UK. And Stuart was a very spiritual guy, taught spiritual things. But, it, but he'd been a drug dealer. He'd been all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And one of his friends was this idiot. And he said he was a complete idiot. And he goes, and he'd come to movies with us, and we like to go see war movies. And he goes, like, five of us all go see war movies, and we go see the war movie. And this idiot guy would drive us all mad because he'd talk all the way through the movies. And he go, he's got his hat on wrong. That tank's the wrong tank. And, and they would all lean on him and go, shut up. And he eventually, like, shut up. Stop telling us. Tell, tell Hollywood. So this idiot wrote a letter to Hollywood and said, you got the, you got the, you got the cap on wrong, the lapels were wrong, the, 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 it's the tong, wrong tank from the wrong year, that's not how it works. Guess what happened to him? I mean, this is a guy who was a schmuck. He was working in a grocery store, couldn't get a job anywhere. I could hope he got a consulting anything. gig. He got a consulting gig. They flew him out and said, well, would you like to guide us on this? He said, okay. He became incredibly wealthy but he had no real interest in a lot of wealthy stuff. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? He bought well, war memorabilia with all the money he bought, bought a warehouse, put his war memorabilia in it, and then rented it to the movies. <laughs> Smart. So they paid him the money to buy the things that they would, he was now renting to them. Smart. And he was getting a consulting gig. That's an example of like understanding everybody's got a genius you just don't mm -hmm. know it yet yeah. and as a leader i think that that's in many ways our responsibility to to elicit mm -hmm. the genius of the person in mm -hmm. front of us even if i want to punch them in the head because they seem like an idiot because <laughs> we all have those moments right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like come on are you thick mm -hmm. but yeah maybe they are in this area because i'll tell you what there's areas i'm really thick you know about you but, you know, I, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be your guy. If you want your accounting done, ooh, you might go bankrupt <laughs> or go to jail. Right? That's not my area. Yeah. I'm thick. Right. But I've got other areas I'm not thick in. And but it's, in, it's interesting in this story because there are places where we feel like we don't know the answer and we're not really invest. We're, we're fine being curious or we don't care. You know, we're fine with disconfirming evidence. But then there are places. And I think that. You know, so I think about like what makes, I'm sorry, but I told you that I'm passionately curious about what makes other people tick. So I think, well, the way that you're describing yourself is, and the way that I feel like I am is, is very unusual. So what makes us willing to explore these outside things? Right. And I think at the end of the day, it's centered on identity. Like if any belief, if any, you know, piece of information came into contact with something that is core to your identity. How is it that you can, can you put that piece aside and say like, well, there's 99 million other pieces of this person and some of them could still be valuable. Is it like comfort in your identity? Because I think that this is what really drives us. And I think something that I identify with is being a human. Like, I think I identify with being an, even an animal or even a part of nature. I think that's really core to me. And that's more central than like a political ideology or being an American or whatever. I'm a human. And I'm like, I want to understand this, this person's human experience. I don't feel like for, you know, we were talking about saying, I don't understand this. I don't understand mm -hmm. this word. That doesn't not make me feel stupid. And that just the same as like asking about somebody else's perspective does not make me feel wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there it's like identity and, and your core beliefs are the things that people is what's preventing us from being curious and coming together as a society. I think. Yeah. As we, you and I talked about in our previous conversation, you know, when I do the emotional source code on a person and I talk about the number one addiction is identity. Mm -hmm your neurochemistry creates an addiction around that process. And so if something confronts that identity, that's incredibly threatening. So, so people say, well, what do you do? I said, build an identity that's not fixed. And they go, what do you mean? I go, I, like, I can acknowledge that I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I can acknowledge that I'm a genius. I can acknowledge that I'm an amazing husband, mm -hmm. except when I'm a dick. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. because I'm not any of those things mm -hmm. on a permanent basis. And the, and this is why I say that if, if you really want enlightenment or, or, or uh, whatever term one wants to use for that, because I think that's probably a bit limited, but um, if you want to become more whole, then you've got to become less of. It's not mm -hmm. becoming more of. So for me, self-inquiry is the key. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. where can I pull this apart and go, yeah, that's not me either. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not me either. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people go, well, aren't you worried that there'll be nothing left? And I'm like, no, I'm actually hopeful that nothing's left. That's actually exciting for me, mm -hmm. that there's nothing left, because then all the ideas I've had will fall apart, and then, I'm, then I can learn from you. And then I, and and that doesn't and that may I might take that on because mm -hmm. I'm an immersive personality. I'll I'll dive into the pool, but what I take out is not the pool. I take out some of the water. Mm -hmm. I don't take the pool with me. I take some of the water and some of the chemicals and some of the other things that are in there. But none of it's permanent. It's just what's stuck in that moment, and I'm willing to be with it. And that's I think is what we need to learn as leaders is how to dive in and be with whatever that is. So I can, you know, I can sit with neo-Nazis. I can sit with Republicans. I can sit with Democrats. I can sit with hippies. I can sit <laughs> with woo-woos. You know, I can sit with those people and, and find what they're sharing brilliant and insightful. Mm -hmm. And some of it, I can also go, yeah, I just think that's crap. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that not that what leadership is? You said something like you learn you know, when you unravel that you can learn from someone else. And I think that something that I believe is that learning with, you know, there's a mutual benefit, right? Like yes. if you think you have the answers and you're trying to clone yourself, then if that were true, then nature would have already settled on the optimal brain design and we'd all have it. Right. Mm. It's like when you clone yourself, you just have more mouths to feed. And I think that, <laughs> went, right. Isn't that yeah, true? I like that. It's good. I mean, we, but deeply, we probably all think, oh, well, no, if I clone myself, the world will be a better place, but we would have landed on that design evolutionarily. <laughs> like a lot of other species freaking have that, right? The peacocks all have, the males all have those big freaking tails because that yep. works. Um, but learning with is such a powerful thing. Like, and, and I think that with my students, you know, with these student mentorship is like this deep version of leadership where you've got someone for five to seven years and you're setting them up on the process of discovery, but I have learned so much from every single one of my students. Like they each teach me something about learning. I study learning in the lab, but yet it's my job to mentor and shepherd these students through this process of discovery. And I think learning with, I guess if you model that, I don't know what that means. You know, you model that curiosity and vulnerability and that you don't have all the answers, then that kind of opens the space for asking questions and learning with. I, I think that's very profound and well said, learning with, not learning necessarily from or to, but learning with, which is the expansion of those both mm -hmm. is is it's also juicy it's it's enriching to to both of us that way and we both get to feel we both get to feel the ego hit of oh i'm I, you know, i'm smart but we also get to feel the the expansion of who we are which is wonderful we're already at the end of part two of our show <laughs> and i know it's flown again um and before we get into you telling people how they can find out more about you um you're a thinker, uh, and and but and I don't mean that in a like I think sometimes you can say you're a thinker and it's kind of an insult. Um, and what <laughs> I mean by that is like you know you're, you've thought about these things and you've decided. Mm -hmm. And I think when I say you're a thinker, I, I'm I would more refer that to an explorer, right? There's mm -hmm. an adventure of learning, uh, and for me that's a great compliment to you. And you may take thank it you, no, um, and so. You know, you, you talked about being this two or three year old watching your stepdad sharpen the knife and realizing that each time it cuts a piece of the knife or, or parts of the knife away, that eventually there'll be no knife. So you, were, you had this ability to look forward. Mm -hmm. What do you want it to say on you? What do you want said at your eulogy in the context of who you've been? Mm. 
I what I want it to say on my eulogy. So interesting because, you know, obviously I spend my life in the ivory tower and you called me a thinker and I, I think I am deliberative, but I think I am much more of a feeler than a thinker. I think I'm really heart forward. And for somebody who knows as much crap as I do, I think I'm very intuitive. Um, but I really want to be um I want people to say that. I walk the walk. I want to live. I guess I want to be not a thinker or a feeler, but a doer and a person who does things that are consistent with the things that I think and feel. I want to be brave, authentically weird or freakish, as you said. And um, and what I really want people to say is that I never, ever put anybody else beneath me or above me, but that I brought them with me. That is beautiful. That is really beautiful. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Please tell everybody where they can find out more about you, about the book, about your uh, seminars, your workshops, and any of the things that you've got as resources. Somehow I feel like I'm closer to dying now that I've imagined my own eulogy. So I'm going to go eat some broccoli for lunch and, uh, <laughs> Hit the treadmill. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Wow. Um, oh, you can find me on chantelpratt.com, C H A N T E L P R A T.com. You can find a book tab where you can learn more information about the book and where to order it. There's also a research tab, which is really fun because it has different games you can play that'll give you instant feedback about how your brain works and what it means, how typical it is how that might shape the way you engage in problem solving, et cetera. Uh, so go check it out. Absolutely. And make sure you also check out the book. Uh, again, we will pro we'll post a link for that inside of the show notes and all the other ones. Again, Chantel, thank you so much for being with us. I hope you stay with us to the end. And for you, dear leader, remember those who control the meaning for the tribe also control the movement of the tribe. Whether you're a business or a political leader, if you're committed to positively shaping politics or business in the landscape, you know that you've got to tap into human behavior, what drives human behavior. And you can do that by understanding what is the emotional source code of yourself and of your organization. I'm Dal Barron. I show businesses, teams, and leaders how to harness the emotional source code to move their tribe. Because unified, actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness, both individuals and in companies. Well, thank you for sharing the show with, with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about the geniuses you're surrounded with that you might think of or have previously thought of as not being that bright. But what if you got curious about where their genius was and how that could add to you so that you could learn with rather than from or to. I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, in your life, and in your leadership impact. And I am out.